participating here and actively participating to this session. Just to mention now, I guess everyone is uh, familiar, we are recording the session. If anyone is gainist, uh, we can stop recording. There are many people who are following other sessions who cannot due to time zone or many other issues. So we record everything. And all over the summer, we will upload all the session of all this conference in the Canadian Industrial Relations YouTube channel to make them available to everyone who wants to listen to our um, contributions. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you and uh, to speak about uh, gig workers and especially to provide analytical and strategic insights. It's been a pleasure to coordinate with different people of the Canadian uh, Union of Postal Workers, to, with the, some uh, uh, young researchers and some practitioners. So bringing all of them together to discuss this issue is very timely because when we started to speak about this panel, we were thinking about gig workers, Silicon Valley, and maybe you know Uber or this kind of platform workers. Right now, in a couple of months, everyone has been transformed into a gig worker into a completely different way of operating and working. So I would ask first to Benedict to please uh, join and share some analytical insights about the transform what is the nature and what are the main analytical dimension to understand the gig workers. I leave you the floor. Yes, thank you, Lorenzo. So I guess I will go ahead and uh, share my screen. So, okay. Right. Um, so first, I would like to say uh, thank you, Lorenzo, for putting up uh, for putting this panel together. I'm really happy to be here with you guys uh, to share on this very important topic. Um, I guess I will uh, quickly share some analytical uh, insights from the literature review I've been conducting, conducting sorry, as part of uh, developing my PhD thesis. Um, so it's a very brief summary. It's by no means a, an exhaustive review of uh, the literature, but I will share a little bit about what I've learned. And I'm hoping that it will um, open up the discussion and uh, bring in some ideas. So, um, obviously uh, the gig economy and uh, the way that gig workers uh, are working is profoundly transformed. And uh, one of those reper repercussions is that there is a reorganization of work. And of course, this has very um, negative consequences, but I will start by uh, presenting the very few positive consequences that there are. So when work is given uh, through a platform or a website for gig workers to execute tasks, it gives them more autonomy and uh, flexibility in choosing what, the ta what task they wish to accomplish. So that's interesting for them. Um, it also gives them the option to have a more var variety in the tasks that they accomplish daily. And it can also give them creativity as they can choose how to execute the tasks and because they choose their um, production process so they can be more creative when working. But as I said, there are negative consequences to that. So as work is given on a platform, the uh, usual supervisor employee relationship is replaced by a client uh, employee relationship and even sometimes a platform owner owner sorry and a gig worker relationship and that really transforms the um, power dynamics especially when a rating system is involved it's not a supervisor that evaluates your work it's really someone who is rating your service and that can lead to uh, feelings of disparagement on the part of working of, of workers sorry and as he said, this rating system uh, really changes things. Now all the gig workers are in competition. So it might lead to work intensification as gig workers are working uh, harder, they're working more to kind of prove themselves on that platform. And also a very uh, important aspect is that since this work is contractual by nature, it might lead to financial precarity 
as um, they might struggle to find more contracts or they, they don't have enough work coming in. So it can be very stressful for them. And as I said earlier, as um, work is given on the platform, it means also that projects and um, work in general is fragmented into more simple tasks that are uh, smaller, shorter to accomplish. And that can lead to a reduced quality of work for workers as the tasks that they're given can be less interesting or less um, stimulating for them. And uh, as the tasks are fragmented, people are less working in collaboration. They don't, they don't interact with colleagues. And that obviously has an impact on building solidarity among workers and uh, eventually on union membership. It's much harder to organize people when there's less collaboration. And the uh, reorganization of work is not the only aspect we can see. There's also a spatial and temporal manifestation on the gig economy. Um, people can basically work anywhere, anytime. So coffee shops, home, libraries, they all become spaces of work. So as I've mentioned, this can lead to increased autonomy and flexibility for workers. It can have a positive effect but it can also blur frontiers between the personal life and the work life. And that can be dangerous. It can lead to more stress for workers. Um, and as it's harder to distinguish yourself from your work, you can develop uh, health issues and less work satisfaction as well. And as we know, um, since you're working remotely and this, um, we can say that this is an effect of uh, working from home as well, not just the gig economy. Uh, people are afraid that you're going to be less productive if they can't watch you doing your work. So this might lead to increased surveillance control on the part of employers. And in the gig economy, that's often done uh, on platforms or that clients uh, kind of supervise you inappropriately. And this also can lead to stress and it raises issues um, for your right to privacy as a worker. And uh, as workers are all scattered around the world, they're ge geographically dispersed. Um, we need to ask ourselves, how is it possible to build solidarity also among workers when they're working uh, at different times from different places. And this is also an, an implication for employee development. As you're not working all in the same workplace, um, how can we promote knowledge transfer and workers training? And that's very important because um, a very important aspect of work is being able to grow as a person and develop yourself. And this, of course, um, there's uh, an impact on the, our legal uh, institutions. And I think uh, some of you will be uh, better able to address uh, this topic than me because I am, uh, my knowledge in labor law is uh, limited. But we need to think about the legal changes that need to be, done, to be done in order to better regulate working conditions for those workers. We need to find ways so that the work that is provided to people who wish to participate in the gig economy is fair. And we also have to think about um, how we can change the legal framework so that unions can play a significant role in that. And I wanna end my short presentation with um, opening up the discussion for strategic insights. It is uh, one thing to say that there are positive and negative consequences uh, with the increasing popularity of the gig economy, but what can we actually do about it? What can we do for workers? So we can wait for uh, legal institutions to react to this and change the laws and regulate it. But I think there are things that we can do in the meantime. Uh, unions and government can provide support to these workers. They can educate them around the negative issues, uh, the negative impacts, sorry, of uh, the gig economy. And they can 
help build solidarity among them, um, social media is a great tool for that. We can create communities of practice and networks of solidarity so that workers uh, can connect one to another and voice their grievance. And as uh, citizens, we can also boycott uh, platforms that are unfair to workers. Uh, we can stop using Uber Eats because they don't treat their employees right. So this way, organizations have feel pressure to actually change and treat, treat workers better. And we have to also pressure them to uh, become more accountable of how they treat workers. And this, I think, um, we also have to educate them about the uh, negative impacts that the gig economy can have on workers and mainly uh, their rating system. We have to publicly denounce that and uh, push for change. So I hope you enjoyed my short presentation and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Benedict. Thank you for this uh, very important uh, starting presentation that can allow us to have a floor to discuss all together. I'm very happy and I saw that Pierre Moreau has been able to, uh, to join us. And uh, as Ryan White, Pierre Moreau is a labor lawyer, one of the most well known in Montreal, if I can say. So Pierre, just uh, to draw on uh, Benedict's point about the legal framework, speaking about gig workers and platform workers, what, what is the actual real, uh, the actual legal framework and what are the gaps, what we don't know? And where it, it is moving? Where is this legal framework moving towards and where it should move to? You should unmute yourself. You should unmute yourself, Pierre. Sorry, apologies. Am I okay now? Okay. Um, well, with Fedora, it's moving in a classic certification mode, but that presents problems, obviously, since Fedora has decided to, to leave town. Um, and the, the threshold issue there, are they employers or not? With all due respect to counsel for Fedora, it seemed to me to be pretty obvious. That point has been litigated before. The analogy to couriers has been dealt with in Canada, in the States, in Dynamex cases, in the Federal Court of Appeal here in Canada has been dealt with uh, in Dynamex in California as well. Um, so, but is that the right way? And when Benedict says that you, you have to uh, build solidarity, it's certainly not a business model to build solidarity. Our uh, labor relations models, uh, throughout the provinces and at the federal level are predicated on 1935 legislation from the states, the Wagner Act. So you've got the employee, you've got the employer, and you have a, an establishment of work. So when you have uh, these couriers that are running around, it makes a lot harder to build uh, the proper conditions to foster that solidarity and to ameliorate their work conditions. So that's one avenue. We'll see what's going to happen, uh, what's going to be the trickle down from the Supreme Court decision of this morning for the class action suit. I wouldn't uh, put too much money on that because it's a lengthy process and the recovery from that is, is really minimal. Um, there is an alternative that is a Quebec-based model. It's called the Extension of Collective Agreement Decrees model, which was very popular in the 1950s, has uh, gone out of favor with the uh, neoliberal uh, economy that we have. But in my view, it would probably be the most appropriate legal framework for the, the type of situation we're talking about here. We're talking about people that are at the lower rung as far as power. Uh, they're spread out all over the place. And you, you have, uh, well, the client is important also, but uh, it might be a bit different than, for instance, in um, 
you've got one of these decrees for the maintenance in offices, buildings. Uh, SEIU is heavily involved in representing those employees. So they have multiple locations. I suppose it's a bit different with Fudora, which is a, a major German-based outfit. But it seems to me that that would be the most appropriate model to, to, to apply in the circumstances. Um, I'm anxious to hear what Ryan's going to say about certification. Is that, uh, I think theoretically it's, it's a possible model. Is it the appropriate model? I'd like to hear him on that. Uh, it's, it's a difficult circumstance. You know, the Treaty of Versailles said that labor is not a commodity, but it is a commodity especially for the, with these couriers and uh, how to regulate this industry. Other options would be to change labor codes and, and to have sectorial certification, but uh, that's not gonna happen. Uh, another change that would be possible, which I would find very interesting, would be something akin to uh, the legislation in California, the uh, Assembly Bill Number 5 that is, I, I think, very powerful. But my preferred course of action would be an extension of the decree system. The decree system, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, legislation from 1935. So just one year before the Wagner Act and before Quebec had its first labor legislation of 1944. And it originates in France in, I believe, 1918, in, or Germany in 1918, and France in 1919. And um, it was brought over here. Uh, it was pushed uh, by a uh, Catholic-based union federation here in Quebec. Um, and it's, it's something that's presently out of favor uh, but in my view, it would be four squares what would be uh, best for this sector of activity. Lorenzo? Yeah, can you just please explain to the audience who are maybe not Canadian or not familiar with the Quebec system, how it actually works, this uh, extension of collective agreement? Okay, well, at its simplest, it, um, a collective agreement is struck between parties in one of the actors asked the government to extend the application of this collective agreement to a whole sector of business, and it could be to the whole province or to a region of the province. So it creates a level playing field. And I mentioned this, uh, in thinking back to Fudora, they, they gave what seemed to me to be a lame excuse uh, that competition, uh, they had to get out of this market, Fedora, what bothers me about Fedora is that they have done exactly what Walmart did when Walmart closed in this little town in northern Quebec called Jean Pierre, when um, the, the, the UFCW uh, in, in, with Walmart had won the right to get first contract arbitration. And Walmart closed up with a cryptic phrase that economic circumstances forced the closure. It made no sense because Walmart is thriving and Fudora uh, is leaving uh, a busy market. So, in, and that bothers me a lot. Um, obviously, uh, in Canada, the Supreme Court has said that you can't stop an employer from shutting down its operations, even if the animus is uh, wanting to get away from unionization but it strikes me as just being so very wrong. Sorry, I wasn't, that's a, an aside. It's not really a, the answer to your question, but the answer to your question is you've got um, a collective agreement and you petition the government to extend it to a whole sector to create the level playing field. The question would be, so now there are many platform workers like Uber, Uber Eat, uh, Fudora, Skip, and many others. So we should have one collective agreement and then extend. Are we able to have one? At least that's a point well, for the question. Well, Ryan, I'm sure has one in his desk drawer. That could be the basis. Thank you, Pierre. And uh, okay. 
look forward to other contribution of yours during the discussion. I would like now to pass uh, to Aaron and then Peggy Nash to have vision of the organizers from on the ground, how the Fudora experience developed throughout time, what were the steps and how Union acted strategically in this uh, campaign. Yeah, thanks. Um, can folks hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Benedict earlier said, is, uni is unionization possible? I mean, short answer is yes. And uh, the results that we had from the vote was 90% of couriers wanted to vote in favor of the union. Um, so we can build solidarity across. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, I guess, about uh, how the campaign came to be and some of the strategies that we, we utilized during it. Uh, because I think that that's helpful to illustrate uh, that it can be done and maybe some of the ways that it can be done. So uh, in uh, 2019, or sorry, I guess uh, 2018, late 2018, um, some couriers approached the union. They'd already been self-organizing. Um, you know, uh, most of these folks, uh, especially those that uh, use uh, bicycles, are um, from the paper messenger world. Uh, so the old couriers that you'd see uh, in, in inner cities uh, delivering bank statements and legal documents and things like that. Uh, and so it was kind of a natural transition for them. And so a bit of a community had already existed. Uh, uh, and in, in Toronto in particular, uh, about, I guess we're saying about five years ago, uh, there was a startup company by the name of Hurrier. Uh, and Hurrier was a, a local uh, food delivery app that a lot of these workers uh, ported over to. Uh, a couple years after that, uh, Fudora, um, a subsidiary of Delivery Hero, which is the German parent company, uh, purchased uh, Hurrier, including all of its infrastructure uh, and its, uh, its lists, and started to uh, make its entry, its only entry into the North American market. Um, so they, they reached out to us uh, uh, looking for help to uh, go past the group of people that they had uh, currently meeting and trying to uh, do do mass outreach. Uh, and, you know, the issues that they brought to us were pretty common issues as far as uh, uh, it goes. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were issues around uh, the classification, which we've heard people talk about so far, the idea that they're uh, labeled as independent contractors uh, rather than employees or dependent contractors under the law. Uh, and uh, the result of that being that uh, many of the basic protections that they would get uh, uh, were, were stripped from them uh, under the guise of entrepreneurial activity. Um, the other uh, issues were uh, shifts. Uh, Fudora is peculiar in the way that it structures its uh, operations insofar as uh, if you work for Uber Eats, you log on to the app, you start delivering food. Um, if you work for Fudora once a week, uh, the company releases shifts uh, to its couriers uh, through a tiered system based on uh, their algorithms uh, determining how uh, efficient or how good of a courier you are uh, and every half an hour on a Wednesday from about 11 a.m. on uh, uh, the, ne the next tier gets to bid on shifts so if you're not in that top tier you didn't get a lot of shifts so that left a lot of couriers uh, in the lurch they weren't able to get what they wanted uh, and uh, added to kind of the financial precarity that we that Benedict was talking about. Um, and then obviously health and safety or uh, health and safety issues was a big one uh, they claimed that they were a good uh, employer insofar as they paid into WSIB, uh, the Workers' Compensation uh, uh, Board in Ontario. Uh, but uh, if it's based on average earnings and it's difficult uh, to uh, piece together any sort of work based on the, the shift tiering, uh, what you end up pulling from WSIB is absolutely nothing. And you're, if you have a broken arm, you can't really deliver food on any of the platforms, uh, regardless of of whether or not you're receiving any sort of compensation from WSIB for missing work from Fedora. Um, in terms of the organizing strategy, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the main challenge that everybody uh, points to is the disparate workplace. Uh, you know, workers are spread out all over, um, you know, in the GTA from downtown Toronto to Etobicoke to Scarborough to to Brampton, to Mississauga, like, I mean, it's not a small geographic area that these workers are in. And, and, it's, and it's tough to know how many are working at any given time uh, and, and there's no centralized work location. Um, but 
you know, I mean, so you can't just go out to the factory gates and wait for people to come out, give them a leaf and say, hey, would you like to join a union? Um, but that doesn't particularly, uh, or that didn't particularly stop us from taking fairly standard and traditional organizing methods uh, in order uh, to, to gain kind of that core that uh, grew the campaign. Um, the first thing we did, we, so we would constantly be meeting with couriers. We had a, a, a small group of, you know, maybe a dozen or so couriers that we were able to uh, um, strategize outreach plans. So we'd be on the street in major areas uh, and, and we would per perfect basically a, an elevator pitch to a courier that you see on the street. You might go on a, ri on a bike ride with them. Uh, you might see them walking into a restaurant and just have a 30 second pitch and, and everything was uh, based on trying to get a phone number or get a commitment for them to come to a meeting. And we'd have an onboarding process where folks would uh, uh, give us their contact information, we'd follow up and invite them to a meeting or they'd uh, agree to come to a meeting uh, and then we'd onboard them at that meeting. Uh, you know, so like I said, waiting outside of restaurants where we knew cars would be stopping. Uh, we, we did nonstop training of the organizing committee, that core group on how to have those conversations uh, on how to, uh, how to move somebody uh, to bring them closer into the fold. Uh, and then uh, we also did, uh, you know, kind of more broad outreach. Uh, social networks uh, already existed for these folks, whether it be Facebook groups, uh, Slack uh, channels that were company sponsored or uh, 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 worker sponsored where you could try and pull uh, information from folks. Uh, and then we would uh, hold workshops. So, you know, um, we would hold workshops on how to repair your bike, right? We would do, uh, we, would, we would set up shop uh, on a major uh, intersection and we'd have a tent and we'd put out, uh, you know, food and drink for people on a hot day. Uh, we do tax workshops for couriers because obviously as independent contractors, it's difficult for them to uh, necessarily know the ins and outs of how to um, file their taxes. I mean, I have a hard time myself, so I can't imagine what it would be like for a courier. Um, we would, uh, we would uh, teach them how to fight parking tickets if for, the, for the drivers, right? Because parking tickets are a major issue for, for drivers. Um, and, and every single time we're making sure that we're giving a pitch, we're trying to build and build and build. Uh, and then at a certain point, we made the determination to uh, be a little bit more creative, and that's when we launched publicly. Uh, and for those of you who know unionization drives, most unionization drives, uh, you want to be underground until the last minute, spring it on your employer, uh, basically call for the vote. Hopefully you have 70% of your uh, workforce signed up uh, and you win, right? Uh, it's that disparate workplace makes that very hard. Um, so we made the determination to go early. We put massive uh, ads through throughout public transit uh, in and around uh, the GTA. Uh, we ran a, a, a large scale digital campaign. And then we, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, branded ourselves uh, 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 with colors on the campaign. And we were out on the street in force so that you could see us on the street. You'd know where we were. We'd had banners, we'd have stations set up. And for the next number of months, uh, we were just, you know, six to 10 to 12 hours a day on the, on the street, uh, trying to find couriers uh, to have those conversations, continuing to build, continuing to build. Um, and through all that, we got people's phone numbers and we decided that it was time to do a blitz. Uh, and, uh, and we started, uh, we, we pulled postal workers and couriers together uh, and did a, a, a couple week period where we, we phoned every single person that we had uh, over and over again until we could meet with them. Uh, and we got them to sign a card uh, and we dropped cards in July of, I guess, July 31st. Uh, so we're almost a year ago uh, uh, of 2019. Um, and, uh, and then again, uh, the, the difference uh, after that fact was uh, the labor board uh, scheduled a vote five days uh, or four, over five days, 96 hours electronically, uh, which is another difficult uh, wrench thrown into the organizing process. Uh, insofar as it's hard to pull your vote if you don't know who's voting and where they're voting and how you're, how you're getting those folks. So again, we uh, use those same phone numbers, those same uh, uh, tactics out on the street and mass postering campaigns uh, to, uh, to do outreach, uh, basically running near 24 hours a day, uh, having people trying to reach out to couriers uh, to make sure that they're voting over that 96 hour period. Um, and then from that point on, 
uh, we've been obviously in the more legal fight and I'll, I'll let Ryan talk about what that looked like. But, but I mean, you know, just to say that the actual process of organizing is not that much different. About five years ago, uh, when I first uh, took this position, I was at a meeting of a bunch of labor organizers and one of the organizers there was uh, upset about Uber uh, taking uh, um, work away, obviously, and fair enough from uh, unionized taxis. Uh, and their response was, we just need to ban these companies. And my response to that was, well, no, we just need to organize the workers. And I think that there's a, we're starting to see a shift now, but there, there was a disconnect for a long time. People thought that it was too hard to do, that it was uh, an impossible task to try and take into a workforce like that and try and organize it. And shortly after we uh, did our campaign, you saw Uber uh, black drivers file for certification with UFCW. You're seeing legislative change happening throughout North America. And you're seeing couriers, like I said, 90%. I mean, we didn't have the strong relationships with all of those couriers like you do in a normal organizing job. But 90% of them wanted a union because they know uh, at the base level that they're getting screwed by their boss. And the only way that they can uh, fight back effectively is with a collective voice. So uh, I think that uh, we just need to uh, push hard um, and be creative and we can win it. So thanks. Thank you, Aaron. I just have two very quick reaction to this. If you can just tell us in one minute about the internal discussion in the union. As you mentioned, many unions, they think, oh, trying to unionize this kind of work is very hard, it's resource draining, and it's not really worth for us to embark into this. If you can just, I mean, tell a little bit about this, um, this without entering into the detail, but this internal discussion. And the second, about the strategies and the organizing strategies, did you try to, I mean, pinpoint some leaders, internal leaders of Fudora careers to then draw on them and have a kind of cascade effect to have other workers? And second, did you try to reach out for other community organization, maybe foreigner community organization in which most of the workers were, most of the members of that community uh, uh, were working for, um, Fudora. Yeah, so I mean, I guess uh, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. In terms of the internal discussions, I mean, I, I can't speak uh, uh, at length about uh, many discussions that are happening inter-union uh, on this, but within CUPW, um, we took the campaign on because we just thought it was the right thing to do. And, um, you know, I mean, every union wants, uh, to organize and they hope that they can, you know, potentially recoup some of their losses through dues. And I think that that's like not a controversial thing to say. Um, but we also knew that this was not going to be a, a slam dunk in terms of uh, our ability to be successful. Um, but no other union had done it, it seemed, uh, at least uh, the gig economy uh, as we understand it in Canada. So it was, uh, it, it was almost a unanimous yes in terms of, uh, uh, CUPW's uh, desire for involvement uh, and to take on a campaign like this. Um, in terms of the organizing, uh, yes, yeah, so strategy-wise, absolutely, we did identify leaders. We, we needed to identify leaders uh, through uh, um, a number of different outlets, and some of them uh, already existed in that core group that uh, we met. But as we expanded, especially into the drivers community, um, you know, the, the courier community that is uh, those, that paper messenger courier uh, skews uh, white and male and uh, 20s to 30s. Uh, the drivers, that's not necessarily the case, right? It's often racialized workers. It's often uh, folks that are doing this job to support families in the periphery of the city. Uh, but they also have their own community uh, where they, you know, like their own WhatsApp groups or other groups where they talk with each other. So when we were able to find uh, drivers, we, that was one of the first things that we tried to do was try to, uh, you know, reach out and find out who the leaders are in those communities so that we could, uh, you know, again, I guess, as you're saying, cascade to try and find more drivers through that, through those kind of leadership networks that already existed in the workplace. Uh, but again, it's a, a little bit different than uh, a brick and mortar uh, uh, workplace, obviously. And then in terms of community organizations, I mean, so, you know, we did work with uh, the Workers Action Center. We uh, worked uh, with, um, 
uh, and throughout this process, uh, uh, migrant workers groups, uh, migrant rights groups, um, because there's a lot of uh, uh, workers that uh, may or may not have all the documentation that uh, uh, is required uh, generally. Um, international students, uh, so going to colleges and trying to work uh, with organizations there to try and find people as well. Thank you. Very interesting. Now, passing to Peggy Nash to have this kind of more emotional point of view. So Peggy Nash is a former member of the parliament and very engaged in any possible labor, labor right campaign that is going on anywhere in, in Canada and even elsewhere. She has been also in Congo to monitor elections uh, last year. Over to you, Peggy. Thank you. Thanks, Lorenzo. Just, I have a couple of slides, but first, I just want to say to Aaron um, and to all of the postal workers, congratulations. I, I just thought it was a brilliant campaign. I had the opportunity just to go down to the labor board a couple of times and, and see some of the, the leaders of the campaign grab a bullhorn and, and speak, uh, speak to supporters, uh, which I thought was terrific. And um, I just thought it was it was a just such a, a well run campaign. You say it's very traditional, maybe because you have to go through the normal steps of the the labor law, but um, the way you did outreach was phenomenal. I know you also had a consumer outreach where you emailed people and said, "Print this Fudora poster, put it on your front door, and when." Um, it, and order food from Fedora. You encourage people to order food from Fedora and then they would come and you would say, did you know there's an organizing drive and have you joined the union yet? So you turned consumers into organizers, which I just thought was so smart. Um, I uh, just again, briefly, 20 years ago uh, in my union, which is Unifor, but was the Canadian Auto Workers, uh, out in British Columbia, there was a local that organized a bunch of Starbucks stores. I think there was about 10 of them. And um, I mean, Starbucks is a very powerful corporation. It was a similar demographic to the couriers in the sense that we had such trouble tracking people down. They would couch surf. They didn't make enough money to, to have stable housing. And, but they were a terrific group mostly young, not all, and, um, but the local had organized, included in these 10 outlets, a bakery. Um, so Starbucks had their own cake supplies. And um, anyway, they tried all kinds of things to prevent going on strike, but ultimately they went on strike. And ultimately, after a huge fight, got a collective agreement, got not a massive increase, 75 cents, but two big things got uh, shift scheduling by seniority and a maximizing of full-time work, which was key. And they got some rudimentary benefits, which they really wanted. But at that time, 20 years ago, our union wasn't super interested. Like the local had just organized and the union didn't think it was a good investment. And I don't think, I mean, it was out in Vancouver. I went in and helped them bargain the first agreement, but I, I, I couldn't get the union to stay engaged enough with them. Anyway, after a while, so what Starbucks did was very smart. They immediately gave every worker a 75 cent wage and said, now you're paying union dues for nothing. So after a while they decertified. But I thought it, what it showed me was workers are workers and they may have a shitty job, but any job can be a good job. So it, anyway, kudos to you. So let me just, hmm, okay, I don't want to hit leave. I want to hit share screen. Okay. Hey, it worked, good. Okay, so mine's more of a general presentation. I'm not gonna get this to, there we go. So I thought I would just first say where I'm from. And this is the center, right now I'm with the Center for Labor Management Relations. It was founded 10 years ago. It does research projects and um, works with a whole range of organizations, community, academic, 
uh, consulting, policy groups, labor management, and we do conferences, workshops, um, educationals on a variety of topics. And why is my yeah. Um, so just some of the recent events um, just this year, in fact, in February, uh, Lisa uh, from the Poster Workers came in and we had a, a workshop on or a forum on called Rights Against the Machines and it was about app work. Uh, and we had um, an academic and organizer from Bologna, Italy come in and it was interesting to see the comparisons. Um, we had a a session on um, service work, uh, serving, uh, tipping the scales, um, labor law. This is after the Ontario government rolled back a number of positive changes that the previous government made after so much work by the community. Um, workshop on building bargaining for precarious workers, the new income basic, or new economy basic income domestic workers, uh, the gig economy. This was about security guards, uh, good jobs platform that worked in a very broad community to um, uh, uh, support developing a, a platform for the provincial election, sharing economy and the future of work and uh, working for a living wage. So in terms of the whole issue of precarious work, it's something that the Center for Labor Management Relations has been focused on for some time. And um, I'm sure as everyone who's on this Zoom knows about the increase in part-time work and the different forms that it takes. Um, economist Jim Stanford talks about how there's nothing new about this that uh, non-standard work was the prevalent work in early capitalism, piecework, homework, on-demand work. And this is in fact an attempt to return to that kind of work, but today augmented by technology. And often the people who are in non-standard work, not always, but often who are in precarious work are people who are excluded from full-time standard secure jobs uh, with the studied indifference of our uh, governments at all levels. Um, and I wanted just to take a look at the, the impact of the pandemic, because I think there's uh, some opportunities here. Obviously the most vulnerable to job loss uh, have been people who uh, we're already in a precarious situation and in precarious work to begin with. Um, young workers, women, more in the private sector than public, more non-union than union. Uh, low wage workers vastly uh, make up the number of people who lost their jobs. And although we don't have good data on this, it seems that many more racialized people um, have been affected by job loss in the pandemic. Um, so the pandemic exacerbated all these existing inequalities. Um, so the most economically vulnerable were also the most vulnerable during the pandemic. They didn't have sick pay. Um, the Ontario government, for example, took away the little bit of sick pay that that people had got through uh, employment standards. They didn't, most of them didn't have savings. They didn't qualify for employment insurance. And Canada did come up with a unique new benefit called the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And it's kind of like a basic income of $500 a week um, that has been very, it had a lot of, uh, different shapes to it uh, as, as people kept clamoring for people who'd been forgotten. But it was key to providing economic support, has been key during the pandemic. Um, but there was also public health considerations. People that were being cheered on as heroes had t-shirts printed in their names, the clerks, the cares, the cleaners migrant workers, warehouse and delivery workers, people that frankly, people didn't much care about before. Um, 
but all of a sudden people realize this is critical work. I, you know, if I have to stay home, I need something delivered to me. Um, if, if I'm sick, I need someone to care for me in hospitals. Uh, obviously, we found that this out in the SARS epidemic, cleaners are incredibly important. Um, and these workers were also key to preventing the spread of the virus. And Canada didn't do a very good job of this. 81% of the people in Canada who died were uh, in seniors' homes, and because most of these homes, privatized, um, didn't want to give people enough hours of work for them to qualify for benefits, didn't pay them enough, so people had multiple jobs and spread the virus from home to home as they went and cared for uh, people in these homes in order to, to make a living and uh, didn't initially get the training, uh, have the, um, uh, the security precautions uh, or the sick pay to, uh, to look after themselves. Um, and now we're in a situation, um, I mean, it sounds like we're going to go through a second and possibly even worse uh, wave of the virus this fall. But there is a lot of discussion about which way forward. And I just wanted to make the point that, um, as I'm sure many people are, that there is an opportunity here. Um, the, um, our former Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, who never fails to grab for a, a right-wing trope, talks about how we need to return to austerity. And um, for a generation of, of people who've been told what the government can't do, uh, can't lower tuition fees, can't help you with your student debt, can't create affordable housing, um, can't create childcare, all of a sudden we see that government can that government is, has lots of money and is incredibly powerful and when it needs to, can move quickly. So I think there's going to be uh, a very vigorous debate about uh, which way forward, and maybe that is the end of my slides, that I think there's an opportunity to, you know, does anybody really want to leave our long-term care homes in the state they're in and, and treating these essential workers, again, as disposable, as unimportant, or are we going to, in fact, um, I thought I had another slide. Oh, there it is. Um, are we going to make the labor market changes we need so that standards apply to all jobs, if, if labor, if we have standards, they should apply to everybody. Nobody should be working for less than minimum wage. Nobody should be vulnerable to health or safety hazards. Um, everyone should have access to the income security of employment insurance. Um, and can we use this as an opportunity to say, wait a minute, precarious work, uh, is dangerous. It's dangerous to the people who do it. It can be dangerous to the public. Why don't we convert these jobs to better jobs? I mean, we saw at Starbucks, we can do it. It's just about the power to make it happen. And we can foster union representation. I do like the decree idea. I think it works well. I had the opportunity uh, um, to, to see it in Quebec. And I think that Fedora, the postal workers, pardon me, at Fedora proved that given a chance, even workers that seem to have the least power will choose uh, to join a union. So I think we should give them the chance to do it. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Peggy, for your contribution. Very interesting. And uh, Ryan, how about the legal aspect of the Fedora campaign? from where did you start from and what were the major things, legally speaking, that you were able to do? Sure, um, and I wanna uh, start with, a, I guess, a, a slightly broader issue. 
um, you know, which is this, that in, in Ontario and really anywhere, when you're talking about um, gig economy workers or any worker really for that matter, pushing back, you're really talking about three different uh, ways of doing so, right? One way is for a worker themselves to file a complaint or, um, you know, as we saw with the Supreme Court uh, decision this morning, so in Canada uh, today, there was a decision in relation to an Uber class action where, um, you know, the issue was, was not whether or not they're employees yet, but um, whether or not Uber could contract out of uh, minimum standards legislation, the question of whether their employees comes next. But so you can either, you know, file an individual complaint or you can bring a class action. Um, you can kind of appeal to government and, and ask government to kind of regulate the industry better. Or you can do what uh, couriers did here and reach out to a union like CPW and seek to unionize. And I, I want to talk then a little bit about, you know, some of the some of the things we found out from the Fedora campaign to unionize here in Ontario, and I think in a lot of ways, um, Ontario is a really good um, kind of test case to look at because I think by and large, you know, we have a legal test that works well. Um, and that's been one of the fights you've seen in other jurisdictions like California, you know, has been over how do you actually test these things. But we have a legal test that works relatively well, but I think there's still a large number of challenges uh, to unionization. Um, and um, so let me kind of come to that. Um, so by way of background, I think it makes sense to start with, I think Pierre had set it up quite well in which he'd said, look, at the outset, you kind of look at this and you just have to think that Fedora had a terrible case. And I would never have said that, you know, while in the midst of litigating it for fear of jinxing everything. Um, but certainly at the outset, the question of whether or not uh, couriers were uh, employees for the purposes of the Labor Relations Act, which is the, the act that governs unions here in Ontario, um, you know, the issue of whether or not they were employees or independent contractors, I think we always felt very, very strongly about this. And one of the great sleights of hand that, um, you know, companies like Uber and Fedora and so on have performed is that they've taken a business model, which with the exception of a smartphone, you know, really is uh, something that goes back to the 50s and 60s. And in fact, in Ontario, this isn't even the first time that there was an electronic dispatch system. Um, uh, for any Lord of the Rings fans, there was actually a case in 1992 where there was a dispatch system called Gandalf, which was the first kind of software-based uh, dispatch system that went before the labor board. And in that case, it dealt with taxis. And ultimately, those individuals were found as a result of that dispatch system to be so-called dependent contractors. Um, but so we always felt very, very strongly about this. You know, in Ontario, the concept of this concept of dependent contractors, which is a subclass of employees, um, the gig economy, uh, uh, kind of people in the gig economy or the platform economy typically, typically fall under. You know, this is a concept that goes back to 1975 in this province, uh, has been subject to, you know, 50 or 60 decisions over the last course, or the course of the last 45 years. And almost all of those decisions have gone in favor of a finding of employee, right? Um, it's meant to be a broad test. Um, and in particular, since about the year 2000, when the Labor Board here in Ontario issued a decision, I think kind of weaving, uh, um, you know, in kind of some of the elements of the rise of precarity and so on, uh, really since 2000, almost every decision, in fact, every decision I'm aware of has gone in favor of a finding um, that uh, employees in this kind of work, so not necessarily gig economy work, but, you know, couriers or dispatch based individuals, uh, are in fact employees for the purposes of the Labor Relations Act. So at the outset, I think we always felt quite strongly about this. I think the, the worry was always more uh, around kind of issues that were more administrative in nature, you know, making sure that we could meet the numerical cutoff to actually have the Labor Board consider this in terms, excuse me, in terms of cards signed and people in the workplace. And I think the issue was always uh, as well, you know, the concerns over timing. And, um, you know, so one of the things I think that we've seen uh, here to come back to kind of what I I'd said earlier about Ontario being an interesting test case is that, you know, in places like California, there's been this whole fight over what the appropriate test is. How do you actually capture uh, employees or how do you identify employees? And I think the challenge we have here is that we actually have a test that works pretty well. I won't take you through the test because it's a, a 10 factor analysis. Um, the labor board here often loves these kinds of, you know, lists where no one factor is determinative, but it gets fundamentally at the question of control and who has the most control uh, and whether these individuals are entrepreneurs or whether they're more, they look more like employees. Um, but the test here works relatively well, um, at least from a legal perspective. The challenge we've got, uh, and Aaron, I know, touched on this earlier, is that 
this is an application that was put in place uh, or, or filed with the Labor Board July 31st. Um, the union was certified finally in June uh, of this year, so it took uh, you know, nearly a full year to get a decision, which is sadly, uh, I think, quite quick by you know, the standards of the Labor Board where decisions are contested in this way. And we've seen a pattern now where Fedora raised you know, a number of, of status issues, so a number of individuals who we had to fight over their employment status and whether they had sufficient connection to Fedora. Um, we see a similar strategy being used uh, with Uber, where in that case, for a, a bargaining of 200 people, Uber has raised 1,000 individuals who they say should in fact be on the list that the UFCW says should not be. Um, and I'm not sure necessarily that the companies are, are you know, acting in bad faith here. I think they have potentially decent challenges. You know, it's that the, the system that's in play right now is, uh, I think, kind of fundamentally broken in terms of how it deals with these issues. And this is exacerbated, I think, by the nature of this, uh, uh, this type of work. One of the things that Fedora had raised during the course of its presentation at the Labor Board was that the average you know, term of employment of individuals in the workforce was two months. And so the problem I think that, that comes up here is not necessarily that we have a challenge determining whether or not these people are employees or not, or even determining you know, who those individuals should be. It's that just from an administrative standpoint, you, know, you spend 10 to 12 months fighting over this every single time. And by the time then you're actually certified, um, you know, a large number of the people who you had uh, signed cards or cast ballots no longer work there. Uh, and you're also now looking at bargaining. And I think that's really, to come back to, again, what Pierre had suggested and some of the things that Peggy had talked about, um, you know, actually bargaining becomes a significant challenge here. You know, I think that, um, you know, again, this, this type of work isn't all that new. And so um, uh, I, I think the, the test we've got potentially works, you know, bargaining over this work, um, has been successful in the past. You know, there's numerous courier companies, for example, and by that I mean, you know, like logistical courier companies that go and through the Teamsters, for example, uh, you know, bargain collective agreements under the Canada Labor Code or under the Ontario Labor Relations Act um, and do so successfully. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not a challenge. And I think particularly when you have that level of turnover by the time you start bargaining, it creates a, a long-term challenge to organizing in this sector. And there's a second issue, and this is an issue that I think both comes up with the Uber decision today, but also with Fedora's uh, proposed bankruptcy, which is that it's not just that, you know, say the workplace is fragmented, it's that the law itself is fragmented. Um, in terms of, you know, how workers are regulated in Ontario, you know, there are about six or seven different statutes, all with slightly different definitions of employees, and all of which uh, are, are somewhat overlapping. And so, um, you know, for example, in the case of uh, Fedora, um, for the purposes of certifying, for the purposes of getting your piece of paper that says you can represent these individuals, you know, there's this test of dependent contractor uh, or kind of a subtest of whether or not you're a dependent contractor. That potentially applies. That's a test that seems to work. But once you certify, um, you know, that term kind of goes out the window and it, you now have employers who, you know, often in cases like this will come back and say, fine, you know, you're an employee for the purposes of the Labor Relations Act, but for the purposes of minimum standards, right? So things like vacation pay, things like minimum wages, all of the kinds of things that form the basis of a first contract, um, you know, there's no, there's no, at least in Ontario, but it's the same really across the, the country here. There's no dependent contractor definition, say, in the Employment Standards Act. So you have employers who come back and say, no, 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 fine, you're good enough to unionize, but you're not good enough to get vacation pay or good enough to get uh, minimum wages, uh, holiday pay, et cetera. And it just kind of sets up this whole new fight now where, you know, you're working under one definition, you now need to kind of change course. With the bankruptcy with Fedora, it was going to have to be the case, and it may still be the case that we have to go off and say, go on a bankruptcy court and say, you know, these individuals you know, are not employees for the purposes of, um, uh, of say, bankruptcy law. Um, so I think that's, you know, part of the challenge here really is, I think, um, you know, organizing, uh, at least from a legal perspective, I think is relatively straightforward. That's not to, you know, undersell in any way the fantastic work that CUPW did. I mean, but really it's not a legal question, at least in terms of, of getting their certificate. It's more, I, I think, a question, you know, the legal issues are kind of more spread out in terms of, um, you know, what do you do once you get the certificate and all of those challenges uh, um, that are kind of, I think, normally we, we kind of think as, as secondary. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answers are yet. I think that uh, hopefully the, the uh, Uber case will make class actions more likely to succeed. I think hopefully the Fedora case, which though it wasn't a surprise, I think is a very, very good decision. That's a publicly available decision. Uh, I think it hopefully 
clarifies things going forward for gig economy applications here in Ontario. Uh, but I think there are still some significant challenges that exist. Thank you, Ryan. And now, speaking about decision making about gig workers and basing decision making on all of also this discussion. So I invite Jean to tell us about how do I work. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Jean Provencher. I work with Senator Francis Lankin. Um, I'm the lead on the Future of Workers file uh, that our office is, uh, is working on. Um, so basically what I'll do is I'll just go through a timeline of, of how we um, decided to uh, focus on the future of workers um, and how we kind of set in motion um, a, a committee study on the future of workers. So back in summer 2019, our office began uh, collecting kind of articles um, that explain some of the problems that were happening uh, because of the gig economy. So um, whether it was, um, you know, something like the Fudora hearings or um, Heller versus Uber, the case um, that was in the courts as well, um, we were starting to see that some of the protections um, weren't available to gig workers. So we were collecting information, collecting articles on that. In September 2019, um, our staff, oops, sorry. Our staff attended um, the National Industrial Relations Conference um, to kind of meet with uh, union representatives um, as well as uh, economists and other experts in the field to talk about um, the future of workers and where they, they were seeing um, things going. In October of 2019, we had a meeting with the Atkinson Foundation. Um, some of you may be familiar with that foundation. Um, they do a lot to uh, promote workers' rights, um, and they work with a lot of organizations to pr promote labor uh, protections as well. Um, so we met with them to kind of gauge um, what was needed, what in terms of what could, what could we do at the Senate uh, to really push um, this this issue forward. In December uh, of December 10th of uh, 2019. We uh, introduced, we gave notice for the motion on the future of workers, and the next day the motion uh, was introduced. Um, so we are still uh, in, in the works of uh, basically promoting this, this um, committee study. Uh, so at the Senate, we uh, at that point um, took all the information that we had and uh, realized that the best course of action was to actually study the issue in a committee. So the committee that we uh, thought would be best to study this was the Social Affairs Committee. And um, we were basically getting support by other senators and uh, uh, gaining support within the Senate to pass this study so that the committee would actually study uh, this issue. Um, and so we are still working on gaining support for this. Um, and obviously COVID happened. So at that time, things it derailed things a little bit, um, just in terms of what the priorities were for the government. Um, but after, uh, you know, we are still working towards this. We're still on this file. Our plans haven't changed. Um, so technically the final report is still, would be still due uh, theoretically. Uh, if this is studied in committee um, on April 7th of 2022. Um, so basically, I just wanted to touch on the rationale for the motion very quickly. Um, the, the motion calling on the social, Senate Social Affairs Committee to study the future of workers uh, was really based on the rationale that legislators needed a better understanding of the economic changes that were taking place and the measures needed to ensure that Canadian labor laws remained relevant to workers. So with all of the technological changes that we were seeing, legislation sometimes has a, a hard time keeping up with all of the changes and that can lead to uh, exploitation and loopholes. Um, so we found uh, our motion sets out uh, four areas that need further study for legislators to truly understand this issue and to be able to make appropriate legislation uh, within the jurisdiction of the federal government. So the first one is um, uh, research and data collection on the gig economy. 
So Parliament has not yet conducted a study that deals with the future of workers in the gig economy specifically. There was a 2019 report on precarious work, but it did not provide a comprehensive understanding of the gig economy or look at the labor protections for people who worked through digital platforms specifically. So we really found that an area that needed further uh, research and further gauging and how different regions in Canada were going to have different problems as well, um, but also um, data in terms of how big the gig economy is uh, was also lacking. So much of the research uh, that needed to be done was to keep um, Stats Canada, for example, keeping track of these things in, in more of a real time uh, type of way. So for example, uh, there's been a recent Statistics Canada report entitled Measuring the Gig Economy in Canada Using Administrative Data. And that really was the first of its kind um, that we've seen. However, it does use census data from 2016. So since then, the gig economy might have grown more. And it's really important for legislators to know how many Canadians are affected or how many Canadians sorry, um, gain their income through the gig economy. Um, so we also wanted to have uh, the experts come into the committee, come into the Senate and explain where the data gaps are. We've just um, uh, kind of identified a couple of them, but we know that there are more. And it's kind of a thing of, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. So having the experts in the committee and actually talking to legislators about it would, would be really useful. And that's one of the one of the areas that we see um, as very useful to legislators. The second area is uh, labor protections. Um, so as many of you touched on, um, there seems to be uh, kind of this gray area where, you know, is it an independent contractor? Is it an employee? Uh, obviously the law has been determining this, um, but we want to make sure that more broadly, um, uh, workers have access to labor protections um, and to to um, to kind of make sure that you know racialized workers, for example, women, indigenous workers, um, are are covered and are um, not discriminated against. So through algorithms, kind of taking the lead in terms of management sometimes and rating systems, there could be unconscious bias. Um, so those kinds of issues, we want to make sure that. Uh, um, uh, that workers are have their constitutional rights protected and see that area needs to be further um, legislated. Um, uh, the third area, um, we see an impact on benefits, pensions, uh, and government services related to employment. So having access to those, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, there's no barriers to access for people who should be getting these benefits. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has introduced CERB and is shown that most gig workers do not have access to benefits such as sick days um, and that these protections for employees may be more uh, necessary in the future if we have second waves or if we have uh, any other pandemics in the future. Um, so in terms of how the economy is changing, how the world is changing, um, what are the responsibilities of employers? And then um, we also have access to employment insurance and who pays into this and who has access to it aren't always the same. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, people who pay into it have access to it and um, that some, some gig workers that might apply to, apply to them as well. Um, and then the last area of study that we would like the committee to focus on is retraining and skills development. So this kind of touches on how the economy is changing, how technology is changing jobs, um, and how we are seeing that um, more and more we need to have a Oops, we had a little bit of technical issue, I guess. Yes. Let's see. She's muted. Let's see if she's coming back. Meanwhile, people can, from the floor, can think about some question to address to the speakers and speakers themselves. If you have any question for anyone else, let's see if she's uh, able to. Yes, she's connecting back. Okay. Hi, sorry. I my other computer uh, totally shut down for some reason. It's like it did an automatic update, and I <laughs> very sorry about that. But my 
on this computer, my camera doesn't work, so I'll just keep going if that's okay with you. No problem, thank you. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, we were speaking about retraining. Yes, okay, so the, the retraining and skills development is another area where we've, we we see uh, would be very useful for the study. Um, like I said, new technologies, um, but also outsourcing of certain jobs um, have led to um, the accessibility of, and usefulness of retraining programs uh, becoming more and more important. Um, so we think that the accessibility of these programs, the usefulness of these programs, uh, needs to be uh, maybe assessed as well in, in terms of looking at the gig economy more generally. So those are the four areas of study, of study uh, that we recommended for the committee. Um, they're kind of outlined in our, they are outlined in our motion, um, just not in the detail I've explained. Um, and yeah, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Very comprehensive presentation of these efforts that touch different aspects to know the nature of the gig workers and then the protection that they need, as well as benefits and pension issues and possibility of retraining. Thank you very much, Jean. Now, it's time for questions. Don't be shy. I have a question. Pierre Moreau, go ahead. Unmute yourself. No, no, we cannot hear you, Pierre. You should unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. I think I did it now. Okay. My question is for Aaron. If Aaron, are you there? Oh, or for Ryan? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, it's been my experience doing um, union certification work, either with UFCW or with Unite. That when, uh, for instance, with Unite, Unite about 15 years ago invested heavily in trying to certify workers in retail stores in Montreal, fashion retail stores. So it's basically a clientele of 20 year olds. And I've done stuff for UFCW trying to certify staples, again, a young clientele. Uh, I was involved in one of the Walmart cases in saint Saint, which is about 15 minutes outside of Montreal, where UFCW was certified and the whole thing lasted so long that by the time the collective agreement was in place, it, the decertification followed because there'd been, a, and this is what Ryan was talking about, a turnover. And uh, have you given thought to that, that certifying people where there is this massive turnover is a recipe for disaster? The point is not to get certified. It's not just to get a collective agreement, it's to get a collective agreement renewed. Mm -hmm and have stability. So what's, what's the point of putting in all this effort if you've got people spread out, no cohesion, no solidarity, they, they don't have roots, they're gonna be there for three months. It's a recipe for a disaster, it seems to me. Maybe I'll jump in uh, on that, uh, only because I think my response um, will probably flatter Aaron and I feel like it makes more sense for me to give it than for him to kind of pump himself up. Um, I, I mean, I've been involved in a bunch of those different campaigns for a variety of different clients. And I do think, you know, one of the things that probably has to be looked at in more detail with this campaign down the road, and I don't say this just because they're one of my clients, but CPW, and I think in particular the Foodsters group here, I think did a really, you know, had a really interesting approach in terms of keeping um, workers involved, you know, when the, when the um, closure took place or when the closure was first announced and we kind of started scrambling to respond to the proposed bankruptcy, um, you know, which again, is not the first time I've had to do that. Um, there was a very well-organized um, kind of apparatus in place of, you know, couriers who had remained involved, who I think had been given you know, tasks and projects to work on, there'd been petitions that had been circulated, you know, around, um, I mean, there was a period kind of pre-closure announcement, but post-COVID pandemic, so kind of March 16th through to about, uh, I think the announcement was April 27th, where the union was really, or CPW was effectively the de facto union um, for foodsters, right? We were, I mean, I was writing angry letters to Fedora about, um, uh, you know, changes in practice and things like that. And it's not perfect. And I, you know, and it was certainly resource intensive. I think CEPW 
has to, you know, deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing whether Aaron has anything um, to add, because mine's definitely kind of as an outsider's view, an informed outsider, but an outsider's view. Uh, but my sense was that was something that they, that they were able to do here very, very successfully, you know, in terms of, um, of keeping people engaged, such that even people who had left, um, you know, were still actively interested in, in Fedora. Yeah, um, and my video cut, I don't know what happened there. So just uh, stare at the black box talking to you. Um, the Thanks, Ryan. I mean, I guess I would just say that, um, yeah, the goal is to get, um, <clears throat> the goal is ever shifting, right? The goal is not necessarily collective agreement. The goal is building power and, and, and asserting that power over time. Um, and so everything that uh, uh, we, we try to do in these uh, organizing drives uh, is is set up the structures that allow it to weather those kind of storms that you're talking about, uh, you know, including things like high turnover. Um, it, the if you took a look at the list of uh, workers that uh, the company stated uh, should be included in uh, in any sort of certification, I mean, uh, there were people that hadn't worked in a year and a half, right? Uh, but they, but they had worked uh, at one point, and the company views them as a uh, as, as as a relevant party. But what we did instead was just we would reach out to everybody, and as long as they were doing work uh, in the sector more broadly, but then as long as they were doing work uh, uh, for Kudora, we would we would set up a, a steward system to make sure that there was regular outreach, that we would give people tasks to. Uh, kind of uh, escalate them up a ladder of engagement, right? Uh, we would uh, have different uh, actions or, um, or events uh, to bring them into. We would be uh, constantly putting, uh, putting our efforts towards building uh, contact and maintaining contact. Uh, and I think that the result of that is that, uh, you know, kind of what Ryan's saying, I mean, after uh, all of this has happened, uh, you know, we were continually having uh, virtual general membership meetings of 30, 40, 50, 80 couriers, uh, you know, that are union members without a company, right? <laughs> and so uh, I think that uh, we, what we need to do and what unions more broadly need to do is turn their mind to how do we put in the structures that allow uh, the power that we're building to be exercised over a longer period of time and like consistently over that period of time, so. Thank you. Thank you for the interest, interesting questions and especially answers. Do we have any other question from the audience? If not, I have one. I wait if anyone we is- We also have one, but I'm, I'm a panelist, not an audience. <laughs> okay, this one, Tony, do you have a question? Yeah, just a, a quick uh, comment on the extension system for uh, collective agreements. So, you know, in France, that it's the extension, and to some extent, even the way the Quebec legislation was written, depends on having a tripartite agreement. You, you need government to intervene, not only with protecting employees' rights, but also having employers who are willing to be at the table and have a discussion about those things. Um, don't forget also, in France, the union density is only as high as it is in the United States, 10% of the workforce. Yet in France, over 70 to 75% of workers are covered by union agreement, by collective agreements. So there's, not, there's a disconnect between being a member of a union and actually being covered in the European case. It's pretty close to that in Italy as well, only higher union density, but even greater coverage as compared to the United States, for example, or Canada, where even with relative United States with 10% or so coverage uh, union membership, coverage is only 11 and a half or 12%. So the decree extension depends on having an institutional structure that can support it. It doesn't just depend on unions, it depends on an institutional framework um, that could uh, allow that to, to happen. So French unions are disproportionately strong compared to their union membership size. 
but compared to the American or North American case. But they're not, it doesn't mean that their membership goes up. It just means that their ability to have a government interlocutor and an employer's association willing to implement those agreements exists. Thank you, Tony. Peggy? Uh, my question was also about the decree system. And my question was going to be, what, why are people, why are those who are opposed to it opposed? Is it what the last speaker was raising, that you need these institutional supports? It seems to me, if you were able to get that in law, um, chances are you would have that kind of state support. But um, so two questions. What are the negatives about the decree system? I guess my question is to Pierre Moreau. And, but also because you I think it's a good system. To me, it sounds like a good system. Um, what are the best examples that you can point to in the province of Quebec? Well, it works well with uh, security guards, for instance, in building maintenance, works very well. In automobile uh, servicing repair, works very well. That's our agreement, yeah. Um, so there are, there are, it covers about, I think, something like 80,000 people now. Uh, in the 50s, it was in the hundreds of thousands. I'm not sure exactly what, but it was 250,000, I think. So there are sectors where it works very well. The steel workers, uh, for instance, with security guards, have collective agreements. The collective agreements tend, tend to replicate uh, the decree, basically. Uh, and yes, uh, Professor Massey is quite right. It, there has to be a government buy-in. Um, we in Quebec are, are fortunate to have a Minister of Labour who knows labour law and who has shown interest in the decree system. So in Quebec, uh, at the very least, th this would be an opportune time to explore uh, the decree system for this class of workers. It's been my experience, just to echo what Professor Massey was saying, that in Quebec, um, steps uh, forward in labor legislation have happened when you've had strong figures in government that like Pierre Marc Johnson in 1977, Diane Lemieux in 2001, uh, forceful people that in the, the council of ministers could convince their, their colleagues to move forward. So is there any appetite to move forward on uh, this new form of couriers I'm, I don't know, uh, but it, it's clear to me that uh, that would be the simplest way through labor standards, through the decree of, of uh, addressing this problem that cries out for help. Thank you, Pierre. Is there any other question? We still have a few minutes. If we don't have any other question, I have a question for all of you. So for the three men, let's look backward. That's the same question I ask when I'm on a PhD committee and when students are defending their final dissertation. I think they say, this is a very complicated question. I think something theoretically methodologic say, no, it's a time machine. I give you a time machine. You can go back in time two, three years. What would you have done differently to better improve labor rights of gig workers? Just in a quick sentence, Pierre. I can, you have to unmute yourself. I, I um, don't, to, to do better, I can't say that anything can be done than what uh, COPW and Aaron have done. Um, uh, and I want to get back to what Benedict was saying at the onset. The, and this is, uh, Professor Harry Arthurs has talked about bringing in the other stakeholders, the population, to express displeasure and move things forward. That might be it. if there is something, and if, we, if I had to step back and say to COPW, maybe ramp up the social activism. Unite used to do that uh, quite extensively. It's an American approach of going to shareholder meetings and, and being very much in your face. Uh, so it, that would be my answer to your question, Lorenzo. Thank you. Ryan? 
Yeah, I'm not sure I would do um, much differently. I mean, I'm at a disadvantage in the sense that I kind of just do whatever my client tells me. But um, um, but I, I think one of the things maybe if I were you know if I were thinking about it, uh, it might make sense to to kind of foreground. Um, I'm not I'm not optimistic, for example, that it, particularly in Ontario, that the government's going to change. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, so part of the issue I think here would be to see if, um, uh, you know, the union can try to help uh, individual couriers, um, you know, say in bringing um, um, their own claims against Fedora or against other uh, courier companies to try and address some of that disconnect between, you know, what the test is uh, to unionize versus what the test is for basic employment standards. Um, you know, but I think that's something that can still be done. So I'm not sure I would do anything differently um i you know i think part of it again is i i, I think to echo what pierre had said i think you know the campaign that cpw ran here was such a good campaign that um you know at least i don't have many regrets um i will note just on what pierre was talking about in talking to other uh, stakeholders that was something that happened here i, I do recall you know at one point in time uh, uh fedora was holding uh uh, or not the door, rather CPW was holding kind of order ins where you would, they were encouraging people to, or, you know, say order uh, um, food and then they might, you know, hand out uh, union flyers to the couriers as they came to the door. And so I guess, you know, it's maybe not a question of what I would do differently if I went back in time. I think it's more of making sure we do the same things going forward. I think there was some really innovative stuff there. So. Thank you, Ryan. Aaron, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, Taking on that, uh, I think the only thing that uh, I would do differently is uh, I would have sought it out a little bit more uh, actively. Um, you know, I guess it's about a year and six months ago that a uh, year and seven months ago that we started this organizing process. Uh, and, you know, I think sometimes uh, CPW, as much as any other union, is guilty of. Um, you know, navel gazing and uh, maybe not looking out, even though it's something that uh, I personally have an interest in. Uh, um, you know, I've worked on a number of different organizing drives. Uh, I think that uh, looking at it now, I wish that uh, we had been uh, exploring far more actively what it would look like to organize those workers, uh, you know, as soon as I got into uh, elected office with the union, which would have been about five years ago, because I think uh, we could be even further along than we are now. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. For the three ladies, let's take a forward-looking perspective. Just in few words, what is the key issue to improve and enhance research on gig workers, action for gig workers, and decision-making for gig, for gig workers going forward? Benedict? Um, well, maybe this is going to be uh a very personal preference but i think like we've mentioned that gig workers can be racialized that algorithms can result in bias that can uh, lead to discrimination and that the gig economy is often an alternative for people who are excluded from the labor market and i think we'll see that um even more as a lot of people have lost their job during the pandemic and I'm wondering if uh, social movement unionism and whole worker organizing is food for thought for the future of gig workers. And uh, more on a research note, I think, um, on a research side, sorry, I think that uh, setting power relationships for a worker because um, a lot of, a big part of workers' well being is how um, they can feel some sort of power on what they do and. Uh, some sort of uh, control as well. Um, so yes, I think that's what I'd like to to see more research about. Interesting. And uh, Peggy, in one minute, less, 30 seconds, <laughs> how we can bring action forward for gig workers? Well, first of all, bravo to Benedict. I totally agree that social movement organizing, you see the energy and dynamism and young faces in the Black Lives Matter movement, you saw the energy in the Me Too movement. Um, in our office, we were just talking about where are the success stories. I think Fudora is a success story, even though the company left, I think it was success in terms of organizing, but where around the world, you know, there in Denmark, in uh, I don't know where, are there places where workers are organized? What is the structure? 
what is the legal framework and are there other, other things we can learn from other places? We've met with people from Bologna, they talked about their experience, but nobody seems to actually have a collective agreement. I want to know where workers have won and I think that can be good inspiration and hopefully helpful for us here. Thank you, Peggy. Jeanne, in the last 15 seconds, what is the key element to bring decision-making forward to improve labor rights for gig workers? Uh, well, uh, very quickly, I guess I kind of outlined the areas where we think legislators specifically need uh, to, to to find more and to research more um, those four areas. But uh, I think maybe um, kind of echoing what Benedict's saying, uh, but also just more up to date data on on the reach of the gig economy. I think that is really key um, in terms of politics, like how big is this? Uh, how many people and Canadians are relying on this as their main source of income? Those are the things that uh, is really going to push the political, um, the political lens uh, of the research for us and, and is going to have the momentum that we need um, to really make this issue a priority. That's fundamental to have data on which you can rely on to make a decision that can affect the life of many workers. Without any further ado, thank you very much. Thank you to our speaker, to Peggy, to Ryan, to Benedict, Pierre, Aaron, and Jean. Thank you for all of you to participate in this session. And please continue attending our sessions throughout the day and tomorrow. Please come and join us at 2 p.m. Toronto time to the CIRA general meeting of all the members. You all will consider members. And see you on Zoom and see you around hopefully soon in person if conditions will allow so thank you thank you to everyone thanks thank everyone